Thank you. Thank you so much for having me and for your patience while we work on the technology. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and a great honor for me to be giving a Roman in garden lecture. Um, in garden is probably the biggest influence on my work of any philosopher and the biggest inspiration for a lot of the work that I've done in fiction, uh, in working on ontology of art and ontology of social and cultural objects. Um, and now I'm shifting over more to work in metaphysics and methodology. You'll still trace the influence there. Um, so the talk that I'll give today, um, Easy Ontology and the Work of Metaphysics, gives a kind of overview of the approach to metaphysics that I've been defending in a number of papers and it was this book that came out a couple of years ago, Ontology Made Easy. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, we're all familiar with and quite at home in daily life with what you might call ordinary existence questions. Questions such as, does a pink planet exist? Do red-breasted woodpeckers still exist in the woods of Arkansas? Did King Arthur really exist? Do quarks exist, or what kinds of quarks exist? These are all straightforward, everyday, ordinary existence questions. But of course, over the last several decades, especially in the era after Klein, uh, metaphysicians have become more and more uh, focused on addressing philosophical existence questions. There we go. Okay. Questions like, do numbers exist? Do properties exist? Do tables exist? Do organisms exist? Do people exist? And so on and so on, right? Humorological sums exist. Um, some of these are questions that have been of interest in philosophy for a long time, but of course others, questions about whether, say, tables and people really exist, those have really been only brought prominently into question in the years after Quine. So the, do the dominant approach to existence questions, of course, in the um, sort of analytic tradition, is what usually gets referred to as the neo-Quinean approach. Though exactly how it's related to the historical Quine is open to question. If you hear this and you say, wait, that's not the historical Quine, I think you're right. We won't do that kind of history now. Um, but the approach is usually traced back to Quine. Um, and here's right, one of the classic quotes from Quine in All What There Is. Who writes, our acceptance of an ontology is, I think, similar in principle to our acceptance of a scientific theory, say a system of physics. We adopt, at least insofar as we are reasonable, the simplest conceptual scheme into which the disordered fragments of raw experience can be fitted and arranged. Our ontology is determined once we have fixed upon the overall conceptual scheme, which is to accommodate science in the broadest sense. Okay, so from out of that inspiration, right, has come the tradition that's come to be known as mainstream metaphysics or neo Quinean metaphysics, right? Thinking of those who ask ontological questions, questions about what exists here, um, so not ontology in ignorant sense, uh, but in the contemporary literate sense. Um, think of them as continuous with the questions, existence questions of the natural sciences, and that the approach we should take in addressing these questions is to begin by trying to find the best total theory. Then, of course, you put it in standard quantificational form. And then, according to Quine, right, we are only committed to, ontologically committed to, those entities that we must quantify over in order to make these properly regimented sentences of our best theories true. So again, this is all familiar territory, but it's worth setting it up. Oops, sorry. So if you have, and this is of course in Quine, um, a sentence like, some dogs are white, right on Quine's reading, this commits us to dogs, we have to quantify over dogs, and say that there are some dogs, some things that are dogs, but we don't have to quantify over a property of whiteness, right? We're just saying of the dogs, that some of them are white, but there's no need to say there is a property of whiteness dogs. Some dogs have. If you wanted to say that, you can just paraphrase it back. 
to some dogs are white, where you don't have to quantify over whiteness. And so, supposedly then, you are not committed to the existence of properties. So this, of course, led to the kind of general form of argument, right? That said, look, find reasons to be suspicious of entities of a particular kind. Moral properties, supposed to be queer, right, according to Mackey, as being action-guided. Uh, mathematical entities, like numbers, they don't exist spatially temporally. Um, tables, they seem to have problematic vagueness and not obey a sort of uniform principle of composition. Whatever, right? Give reasons to be suspicious of them, to think we would be better off without them, and then engage in a kind of Quine style paraphrase to show how we can say what we wanted to say without quantifying over the offending entities. Then you can legitimately claim, according to this tradition, that there are no such objects, or at least you don't have to be ontologically committed to them. Right? So that's the standard methodology. OK, and so in the wake of Quine, then, we, of course, have seen the popularity and proliferation of a number of, especially eliminativist views, that claim to give us a more parsimonious theory of what exists right, by engaging in this kind of paraphrase. So Hartford Field, of course, um, argues that numbers don't exist and shows how we can paraphrase scientific language even about numbers in a kind of nominalist language. Peter Van Inwagen famously argues that ordinary objects, material composite objects like tables and chairs don't exist because there's no good metaphysical principle of composition that would get us tables and chairs without getting lots of other weird things. And he shows us how to paraphrase talk about tables, say, into talk about particles arranged table-wise. Right? They don't have to quantify over tables. Fenton Merritt gives different arguments against tables, also argues that organisms don't exist, that if they existed, they would be causally redundant with respect to their parts. And so again, we can just talk about particles arranged catwise and paraphrase our talk without quantifying over organisms or ordinary objects. All right, so that's just a reminder of what metaphysics has come to, in a sense. And if you think of metaphysics in this way, as engaged, like science, in trying to make worldly discoveries, but where these discoveries might involve <laughs> discoveries that certain kinds of things, even the most familiar sorts, people, tables, chairs, cats, don't exist, you run into certain hazards, right, that have become increasingly obvious, and hence the increasing interest in metaphysics in the last 10, 15 years, right? But here's some problems, here's some hazards you get into if you take that approach to metaphysics. First, pretty obviously, you run into apparent conflicts with common sense. Common sense views such as that tables and chairs and persons and trees exist. Right? Some people don't care about that. There's other hazards to worry about. Right? Here's another one, is a rivalry with science. Right? If you think of metaphysics as involved in doing the kind of deep work of discovering worldly truths about what exists and what it's like, you might think that was the job that the sciences were supposed to do, and that they have better epistemic credentials. And so you get people like Stephen Hawking, who with Leonard Mladenov wrote in a recent book, people have always asked a multitude of questions. How can we understand the world in which we find ourselves? How does the universe behave? What is the nature of reality? Where did all this come from? Traditionally, these are questions for philosophy, but philosophy is dead. Philosophy has not kept up with developments in modern science, particularly physics. Scientists have become the bearers of the torch of discovery in our quest for knowledge. Right? This is a particularly harsh articulation of the view that there's a rivalry here with science. If you take this view of metaphysics, a rivalry metaphysics seems bound to lose. A 
problem, right, is that as metaphysics has had this really post kleinian revival, what we've gotten is an increasing proliferation of metaphysical views. You get more and more views that are ever more spread apart from each other, nothing like the kind of convergence on the truth that we tend to see and expect rightly from our scientific theories. Here's one way of measuring this. If you're familiar with, there's a survey on film papers. I don't know if anyone did it. Um, Dave Chalmers helped organize it a few years ago. And they asked 3,000 philosophers, professors or grad students, I think it was, 30 questions to give their opinion on. Like, you know, does free will exist, for example, as their a priori knowledge? Platonist or nominalist about abstract objects? They got their answers. Brian Francis has done a sort of statistical analysis of these responses, saying that based on the diversity of answers, if you think of these as questions with a correct worldly answer, then we ought, based on the statistics, to think that the average philosopher gets 47% to 67% right. Not very impressive, right? We all hope our doctors do better than that when we're getting right the questions about our health. Right? Um, and we're supposed to be the experts. Right? Um, and so on the basis of this, Francis says, look, clearly these answers to these questions are just really hard to know. And I shouldn't have, and for each of us philosophers should say this to ourselves, any confidence that I'm better than the average philosopher. So I should just suspend judgment. The right thing to do is to come into a kind of skepticism about our ability to know the answers to these metaphysical questions, and maybe go do something more useful. Another problem for mainstream metaphysics, and this is what I've tended to press on, is the epistemological mystery. That is, how are we supposed to gain knowledge of the right answers to these questions in metaphysics? Right? Um, most of the competing theories in any given case are empirically equivalent, as all of their defenders will acknowledge. There's no experience you can use to prove that there are chairs rather than just particles arranged chair-wise, or a world full of features where the most you can say is it's chairing around here. Right? So what can you do? Well, there are responses, of course. Those in mainstream metaphysics haven't been without attention to this problem. Usually, they treat it in about a paragraph that says something like the following. Well, look, we choose our metaphysical theories by appeal to theoretical virtues. Sometimes, there's two different versions of this approach. One treats um, metaphysical theories as confirmed in the same way as scientific theories are, with a kind of parallel. The other will say they're confirmed with scientific theories as part of the best total theory. Let me go through those in turn and suggest why I think these responses are both problematic, at least. I won't prove they can't be done, but I'll give reason for thinking it's not that easy. You can't just solve the epistemological problems with this quick one paragraph analogy to the confirmation of scientific theories. Okay, so the um, view that metaphysical theories are confirmed just like, in the same way as, scientific theories are, has been most fully defended recently by Laurie Paul. Right? So she writes, we use theoretical desiderata as guides to truth in metaphysics, just as we use such desiderata as guides to truth in science. If such theoretical desiderata are truth conducive in science, they are also truth conducive in metaphysics. All right, but there's reasons to worry about this idea that there's this sort of clean analogy between the confirmation of scientific theories and the confirmation of metaphysical theories. One crucial disanalogy, which Paul recognizes, is that metaphysical theories are typically empirically equivalent, as I mentioned. Whereas, scientific theories are only very rarely even empirically close in their predictions. Never mind, there's other theoretic virtues. Parsimony, unity, explanatory power. 
Can we use those to figure out which metaphysical theory is right when they compete? Well, as Karen Bennett and Uriah Kriegel have each argued at length in a lot of the classic debates in metaphysics, the competing views tend to just trade off one theoretical virtue for another. We'll trade off parsimony, uh, logical parsimony for ideological parsimony, or trade off um, simplicity for explanatory power. So you're very unlikely to get anything like a clear answer by this. You just get shifting which theoretical virtues you have. There's further worries, too, and I mean, it's an open question in philosophy of science whether the empirical, sorry, theoretical virtues other than empirical adequacy are really truth conducive, right? Or if they're just pragmatic. If simplicity, for example, conduces to truth or just makes it easier for folks like us with our limited brains to use these theories, right? And um, Phil Bricker has a nice paper pushing this point. Even if you think they're truth conducive in the sciences, however, there are extra worries about whether there's really just a difference in degree here, as Laurie Paul and other mainstream metaphysicians think, like, yeah, okay, metaphysics, it's hard, it's going to be comparatively uncertain, right? But it's only a difference in degree from the sciences. But there's questions about whether this is really just a difference in degree or a difference in kind. So, for example, Michael Huemer has a recent paper arguing that there's four main kinds of reason you might think parsimony is truth conducive, not just a pragmatic virtue, but that none of these would apply to metaphysical theories. Um, Scott Schalkowski has a nice paper arguing that even if we think inference to the best explanation is an epistemologically successful route to take for scientific theories, these don't carry over for the metaphysical case. And Yuha Satsi has a similar case. I don't have time to get into all those details today, and that's other people's work, but I want to at least point to this as a way of suggesting it's not that easy to just say one shouldn't just assume that if theoretic virtues work in the natural sciences, that carries over to solve our problem for the epistemology of metaphysics. Now, this is another group, which is really, um, again, very common. It's been articulated recently by Ted Sider, which is not to say that our metaphysical theories are confirmed in ways parallel to scientific theories, but they're confirmed together as a bundle. That is, that our scientific theories include metaphysical presuppositions, and these get confirmed along with the theory. So here's what Sider says. We should believe generally what good theories say. So if a good theory makes an ontological claim, we should believe it. The ontological claim took part in a theoretical success and therefore inherits a borrowed luster. It merits our belief. Right, I'll leave it up there. And then again below, we have the feasible reason to believe that the conceptual decisions of successful theories correspond to something real reality structure, right? So he thinks both the ontology and the ideology of a scientific theory are confirmed with that theory. Oops. Okay, so let's look at that suggestion. Again, I want to say not so fast. Right? Are the metaphysical presuppositions of our scientific theories confirmed with those theories? Well, one reasonable criterion, and you see this developed by Stathisilos and picked up by Catherine Hawley, a criterion for when something is confirmed as part of a scientific theory is to say it's confirmed with that theory just in case it takes part in or helps fuel a prediction, the confirmation of which then confirms the theory. One way to articulate this is the idea that only the, what Steve Diablo calls the assertive content of a theory is confirmed with the theory. Let me spell that out for those of you who haven't been through Diablo's recent work. So Steve Diablo has this neat way, those of you who come to the seminar tomorrow, we'll talk more about Diablo then. He has this neat way of distinguishing 
the presuppositions of a statement from its assertive content. So suppose you have a statement like, the number of planets is eight. This seems to presuppose that there are numbers, and eight's one of them, and it numbers the planets. Right? However, suppose, as Yablo would put it, not my language, numbers turn out not to exist. No problem, because really this statement has an assertive content that can be put as, there are eight planets. And that remains true, whether or not the presupposition of the existence of numbers is true. Yeah? Now contrast this with some other presuppositions. If you say instead, Vulcan orbits the sun five times in an Earth year, that presupposes the existence of a planet Vulcan. But if it turns out, as it turned out, that there is no such planet, then there's not an assertive content of this that remains true. Right? The whole assertive enterprise is wrecked, as Yabla puts it. So, right. so what I've argued in response to Yabla's work is that we should, in general, conclude, based on his criteria, that all ontological claims, all the ontological presuppositions, are fail-safe in his sense. That is, the presupposition could fail, and yet the assertive content of the claim remain true. Right. Um, so for example, take one about concrete entities like muriological sums. You could say the muriological sum of the particles in solution weighs 29 grams. This presupposes the existence of muriological sums. Yeah. And yet, one can subtract that presupposition, and the assertive content remain true and intact, that the particles in solution jointly weigh 29 grams, now not quantifying over muriological sums. So, the thought is then that if these ontological presuppositions are characteristically fail-safe in Yablo's sense, then they could fail while all the theory's predictions remain true. That seems to be a way of showing that they're not fueling the theory's predictive success in this way. And so that they don't share in the confirmation of the theory, because the theory, its assertive content, can be just as well confirmed even if we drop that presupposition. All right, so that's the thought. Another way of getting at a problem with the idea that the ontology of a theory is confirmed with that theory can be drawn out using Eliot Sober's contrastive empiricist approach. Sober argues that a theory is confirmed relative to alternatives, right? Not just, you can't just talk about confirmation simpliciter. Uh, but the way that you can figure it out is um, by what's different between the two theories. So if you have the same map, this is what Sober cares, cares about, or the same ontological assumptions, say the assumption that ordinary objects exist, that are part of two competing theories, they're not tested by the observations. They're shared by the theories. They have this in common. They won't tell which is the better theory. Right? To get evidence, through this kind of scientific method, for ontological hypotheses, we'd have to be able to test two theories that differ in their ontological presuppositions, where those differences lead to differences in the probabilities they give for future observations. But again, metaphysicians all agree it's not going to make any empirical observational difference, whether you accept, say, chairs or particles arranged chairwise. So it looks unlikely if you accept a kind of sober view of confirmation that we could legitimately say that our ontological presuppositions are confirmed with a theory. OK, so that's all preliminary. That's just some reasons to worry. I think this isn't a solution to the problem of the epistemology of metaphysics, that the serious metaphysician can go off in a paragraph and be done and be secure in their work. so far is to run through 
some problems for mainstream metaphysics, right? Uh, the conflicts of common sense, rivalry with science, lack of convergence that leads to this kind of skepticism that we can never know, and the idea that we should just give up, and the epistemic mystery, which I've suggested isn't so easily resolved as its defenders think. What I've done in some of my past work, this isn't to say that I don't, that I think the arguments against different kinds of objects shouldn't be taken seriously. Right? In my prior book, my second book, Ordinary Objects, I look at the details of a lot of the arguments against ordinary objects, from violations of parsimony, rivalry with the scientific ontology, problems of vagueness, problems of comp uh, composition, alleged contradictions, and try to show a way around them. Right? So I do think that our standard ontological beliefs are open to challenge, and we have to take those seriously. I've done that kind of detail work elsewhere. Beyond that, though, and this is in my most recent book from 2015, in Ontology Made Easy, I try to assess or diagnose where we've gone wrong in metaphysics. And the diagnosis that I give is that the whole neo kleinian methodology has gone wrong and needs to be replaced. Um, and there, I try to revive and defend a much more down-to-earth view of how to understand existence questions, and how to resolve them, and of what the role of philosophy can and should be. And this is a view that harkens back to pre quinean days, right? So it has been, in my tradition, a kind of forgotten alternative, but one that was incredibly popular, say, 100 years ago, right? And that's roughly the idea that there's something like a division of labor, that philosophy is not like a science or confirmed with a science, but it has a different kind of work to do, roughly conceptual work, where the natural sciences are roughly concerned with empirical work, not to say that either of them can't make use of the other at certain points or help each other. And of course, this is a view that in some form was defended by philosophers as different from each other otherwise, as Wittgenstein, Husserl, Gilbert Ryle, and Roman Ingard. And in this, I think of my approach to existence questions as really kind of helping, being inspired by Ingarden's view that there's a distinction between ontology and metaphysics, where in ontology we try to lay out according to the very meanings of the experiences that present something as being a table, a work of architecture, a work of music, and figure out what it would take for there to be these things before you ask the question, are there really such things, the factual question that he identifies with metaphysics. Now Carnap, of course, famously, distinguishes two different kinds of existence questions, internal and external. What I was doing in Ontology Made Easy, you can see is roughly focusing on the internal side. Where I'll bring us to today is also showing how I want to handle the external side of what it can do for us. Okay, no, sorry. So internal questions in Carnap's view, right? Famously, he treats as questions that are answerable by empirical or logical means. So if you want to know whether there are red-breasted woodpeckers in the woods of Arkansas, you can set up your secret cameras or look for their droppings and find out empirically. If you want to know whether there's a prime number between 70 and 80, you can do the relevant mathematical calculations that are the logical means. But of course, as Carnap notes, the answers to these particular questions are generalizable. So if there are woodpeckers, then there are organisms. Right? Um, if there's a prime number between, well, let's say, what, 1 and 10, then there's a number, and so there are numbers. And so we can answer these general ontological questions also through inferences, trivial inferences, from these questions that are answerable by empirical or conceptual methods. External questions on Carnap's way of handling things, right? as he puts it, well, they're senseless if understood as factual questions. Right? They're often expressed like, are oh, there really numbers? 
are really organisms. But as Carnap puts it, they're better understood as pragmatic questions, questions about whether or not to adopt a certain conceptual or linguistic framework. OK, so an ontology made easy. I really defend this kind of neo-Carnapian approach to existence questions, mainly thinking of them in the internal mode there, and argue that all well-formed existence questions, there's some I think are ill-formed, but discussed elsewhere, can be answered by straightforward conceptual work, and sometimes also empirical work. And secondly, so we don't need anything that's in Ted Sider's terms uh, epistemically metaphysical to answer these. It's supposed to remove the mystery. Secondly, I argue that many of essentially disputed existence questions can be answered by trivial arguments from obvious premises. This is basically adapting and generalizing something like the neo Freudian approach in mathematics. So here's a trivial argument. This is the neo Freudian, well, it's supposed to be a Freudian argument, it's a slightly different version, for the existence of numbers. Start from, say, an obvious undisputed truth, like there are two cups on the table. You can then trivially infer if there are two cups on the table, then the number of cups on the table is two, from which you can conclude that the number of cups on the table is two. Um, and then the, you can also infer there is a number, namely two, the number of cups on the table. We can get trivial arguments for other sorts of things. Also, uh, easy argument for properties. This is similar to some of Stephen Schiffer's work. It goes like this. Start from an obvious, undisputed truth, the square is red. From that, we can make the trivial inference to the square has the property of redness, and then infer that there is a property of redness. I generalize this approach, which has so far only been done really for abstract entities, suggesting you can get a similar easy argument for ordinary objects and organisms by making trivial inferences from statements that even the eliminativists will accept. So Van Wagen gives us the terminology of particles arranged table-wise, which is supposed to be that the particles are arranged not only in such a shape as the table is thought to occupy, but also builds in whatever other social and cultural conditions are required. So if you think tables have to be built by an artisan intending to make something in the right context, build that all in. That all goes into particles arranged table-wise for Van Wagen. And if it doesn't, his paraphrase strategy doesn't work. So go from that. There are particles arranged table-wise. Make the easy inference. If there's particles arranged table-wise, that's a table. Two, there's a table. Good. OK, so if you, obviously, there's lots of objections to these easy arguments. I handle most of them, all the ones that I knew of, in the book. I won't do them all now. We can talk in the Q&A if you want. Um, but the conclusion that comes out of doing these first order existence questions using this easy method is that something's wrong with ontological debates. The usual way of saying something's wrong with ontological debates developed by Eli Hirsch is to say, look, they're just verbal disputes where the people are talking past each other using terms in a different way. I don't analyze this as verbal disputes. Instead, I think the problem is that the questions, are there tables, are there properties, are there numbers, taken in Carnap's internal sense, are answerable too easily to be worth these kinds of protracted debates. <clears throat> then, the main objection that I got following that book was, OK, but then haven't you just made them too easy, in a sense? In thinking that these philosophical questions can be answered by tri often trivial arguments, and certainly by nothing more than empirical and conceptual work, how can you make sense of the feeling that philosophers have, that they're really disputing, that these disputes are worldly and important, that they're not just settleable by these kinds of trivial arguments? And that's sort of what I've been working on since. What room, in short, my critics ask, is left for metaphysics? Well, there's one obvious answer. This is where I started. Right? 
Um, the traditional answer is, look, go back to the division of labor idea. There is work to be done as metaphysics that's done in conceptual analysis. And so, then of course, this captures a lot of what in the real tradition, going back to people like Hume and Locke and so on, was done. Right? So we can be interested, for example, in relation to among our concepts. How does the concept of freedom relate to the concept of well, determinism, or to responsibility, to morality, to personhood? Right? You can draw out all those kinds of conceptual connections. Or you can even try to get a general map of our whole conceptual system, like Strawson does. Or ask about the logical geography, as Ryle puts it, of our mental kind concept and how that's related to our dispositional concept, our physical concept, etc. Now, we can still do all that. There's also always going to be new work to be done in conceptual analysis because we have to worry about how our concepts, our old familiar concepts, apply in new circumstances. Right? Concepts like person, for example, could that ever be applied to something with artificial intelligence or not? Could it still be applied after a trip through a, um, a teleporter, right? And so on. Um, moral agent, um, death, right? we've had to redefine death in order to take into account changes in medical technology, right? When you can have um, a kind of artificial respiration and support of the heart, right? While brain functioning is or sometimes is not maintained. All right, so there's still work to be done there. That's where I started, and I think that's as true as ever, and this is the view roughly defended by people like Ryle, Strawson, uh, more recently Frank Jackson, right, who says that um, what we job to do is to figure out how, say, moral concepts relate to what to say about them, given what we know about the applications of physical concepts. That's all good. But I think we can even do more. But that's the only answer that's given. Again, you'll see, you can see things as looking like that you're in some sort of dilemma here, right? You've got two choices. You could treat philosophy as on a par with science, <coughs> then you get these problems, or you could adopt something like the division of labor view, the view that philosophy involves conceptual analysis, roughly. But then its critics say, yeah, that just gives us a shallow and uninteresting, superficial conception of philosophy's work and value by making it just about our concepts or our language that we happen to have. I think that's an overblown criticism in any case, but I think there's more we can say. So Ted Sider voices this opinion. Right? He says, eh, who would prefer exploring our perhaps parochial conceptual scheme to exploring the fundamental features of reality? Right? The thought is metaphysics should be worldly, right? not just about whatever concepts or language we happen to have. Yeah, okay. So here's what more I think we can do. This is reviving something like and developing Carnap's idea that we can also understand these as external questions. That is, um, we can be involved when we do metaphysics. This is another branch of philosophy. Not just in asking how our concepts or language does work, but in figuring out how it should work, what conceptual scheme we should adopt, what rules we ought to adopt for the different concepts that we retain, and so on. So we can ask questions, not just like, how does our concept of art or person or freedom work, um, but which one of the alternatives should we adopt? And for what purpose? Do we want something like the compatibilist concept of freedom? Why? Would it be better to go with something like the incompatibilist concept of freedom? I don't think you can even see those debates put in roughly those terms. How should we revise and precisify our concepts if they need precisification at all? But suppose you have to precisify the concept of death in order to determine a time of death so accurately that you can engage in organ transplants more successfully. What should you say now about exactly when death occurs? Frederick Gert has a lovely paper doing exactly that. Which concept should we keep? And which one should we reject? 
Given the truth of determinism, should we just reject the concept of freedom altogether as misleading and giving us sort of a wrong-headed reason for engaging in blame and punishment? Or should we keep it? Should we keep our number concepts or make do with a nominalist language? Should we keep our old-fashioned standard race concepts? Or should we reject them, as Appiah suggests, or revise them, as Haslinger argues, right? And so on. So where I think a lot of the really interesting work for metaphysics to do lies is in engaging in this kind of normative conceptual work that's very much left open, even if you're a deflationist like me. I think, first of all, that it gives us a good way of accounting for a lot of work that metaphysics has done. And this requires some detailed studies. I've only done a few, and maybe you'll have other ideas to tell me. But the crucial point here is that when metaphysicians dispute in the object language about whether a person would survive a trip to the teletransporter, right, or whether a work of art can survive um, being copied. Right? We have two copies, we have the same work of art, or a mere copy right, in the cases, and so on. Um, these debates that are conducted in the object language as being about persons, art, freedom, can really be seen as engaged in what David Plunkett and Tim Sundell have called metalinguistic negotiation. And the idea, I have a time to listen to see. Yeah, okay. There's also, I'll put that in a sec then, um, work for metaphysics to do in conceptual engineering in determining when we need to alter our concept, and if so, how, which, where we need development of new concepts, and so on. I'll talk a bit about both of those. Okay, so metalinguistic negotiation, right? The idea is this. There's a great many cases, <coughs> excuse me, in ordinary life where we engage in what look like straightforward worldly disputes in the object language, but where what we're really doing pragmatically in this engagement is pressing for views about how we should use the terms or concepts involved. So the case may start with this torture, right? So suppose there's a disagreement about whether waterboarding is torture. Right? It might be that the disputants don't have any difference in their beliefs about what the facts are, what waterboarding tends to do, how likely it is to get information out of the victim, how, what long-term psychological or physiological effects it has, when it's been practiced. They might agree on all that. They still disagree about whether it's torture. It's also not resolved by figuring out how the word is used. Right? If you're in the US, you could apply the US Department of State definition and say, clearly waterboarding is not torture. But that's not going to resolve the dispute. Now, the United Nations definition is different, and waterboarding is torture on that definition. But we also shouldn't leave this dispute saying, oh, so they're just talking past each other, and they're each writing their own language. Because there's real worldly matters at stake here, right? matters that involve whether waterboarding should be permitted or not, what punishments should be given to its perpetrators, if any. Right? And so on, there's all sorts of real world issues to be resolved here when we ask the question whether waterboarding is torture. It's not just a verbal dispute, but it's not a factual dispute either. Right? What's going on here on the analysis given by Plunkett and Sandel is they're using the word torture as a way of negotiating for how it ought to be used, also given its conceptual connections with other sorts of terms, right? So, yeah, normative terms. So these are some characteristic features of a metalinguistic negotiation. There's no facts that disputants disagree on, or at least we can't trace their disagreement to any such dispute. They're not going to be resolvable by further information. We can't go do an empirical test to figure out if waterboarding is torture. They're not resolved just by asking how the word is used, or by revealing that these two people use terms differently, as is the case in classic verbal disputes, like disputes over whether a glass is a cup. Um, and there's real worldly matters at stake, matters in, to, at stake in terms of what we do and how we live. Yeah. Here's a whole big other list. Once you see them, you see them all over the place, these metalinguistic negotiations. Right? 
I once had a long, before I even knew the word, I had a long metal linguistic negotiation with Ted Snyder over whether figure skating is a sport. Like, figure skating a, a sport, a real sport, or not, right? Is, um, is Iowa in the Midwest of the US? Can there be such a thing as domestic terrorism, right? Um, I also submit to you that a great many of the philosophical debates we're familiar with, what is art, right? What is freedom? What is a person? When you look at the details of these debates, you'll see the reasons given that much better fit this model than the model of form based discovery. Right? So Clyde Bell, for example, argues that art is significant form because adopting that conception of art will allow us to bring into the canon and value the works of people like Picasso and Cezanne and Matisse, and not just the old representational forms of art. OK, so I think we can analyze a lot of past debates as engaged in metalinguistic negotiation. Not all. It's one tool in the toolkit. But a lot of them fit this model well. But what we're really doing is pressing for views about how these concepts should be used. So I think this view of metaphysics that I'm pressing for has continuity, at least, with historical metaphysics. Whether or not you like that interpretive claim, I want to lay out a normative claim that this is how we should reconceive of metaphysics as engaged in issues in conceptual ethics and conceptual engineering. How do we do that? I've got a much longer story about that. I'll just give you the brief version. But first, I think one should ask, what function the relevant concept or range of concepts has served for us? What function has it served or doesn't serve for us to have a term for freedom in our vocabulary? Or to have number terms in our vocabulary? Or a term like truth? Or a term like morally right? Like, what can we do by having these terms in our language that we couldn't do otherwise. Once we assess the function, we can better ask if this is a term we should keep or reject. Right? Um, and then, once we know the function as a real engineering, uh, you don't want to build a tool without knowing what its function is supposed to be, or build a boat without knowing whether its function is speedy travel, carrying cargo, cutting through the Arctic ice. Right? So you start with an assessment of function, and then given the worldly factors involved, we try to assess what will enable it best to serve or better to serve that function, taking into account its connections to other concepts, worldly constraints, and so on. OK, so that's the method that I've been pushing for. To get explicit about the role of conceptual negotiation in doing metaphysics, and to get explicit then also about how we should do it, what sorts of factors we should appeal to. This gives us important methodological differences from the kind of mainstream metaphysics I began by explicating and criticizing. Right? We don't have to have any appeals to theoretic virtues or metaphysical theories. We're not really thinking of them as worldly theories at all. We don't have to have a sort of dubious appeal to confirmation of the scientific theories. We can drop that so we're not subject to all those problems. Um, instead, all we do is proceed empirically and analytically in answering the internal questions and pragmatically in addressing the external questions. Now, if we adopt this, in some cases, our work won't change much, I think, if we're trying to figure out how we should define art or freedom or whatever. In other cases, though, I think it will lead to a very different kind of evaluations of our old debates. So take debates about the existence of numbers. Right? Start by asking, what's the function of having number concepts or noun terms for numbers in our language? Well, one nice view developed by Steve Yablo is that only by having these noun terms in our language can we express certain kinds of scientific generalizations in finite form, where otherwise they'd, be, they'd require an infinite series of infinitely long statements to express them. Oh, well, if that's the case, then having number terms is pretty useful. 
and you shouldn't just throw them over due to some ontological concerns raised by a misguided kind of neo-Kleinian methodology. Now, here's a, make, a, a way of making a case for this kind of deflationary approach. It sees the internal questions as answerable through these straightforward empirical and conceptual means, and the external ones as to be addressed by work in conceptual ethics and conceptual engineering. First, you're going to get the common sense answers to existence questions taken internally. Are there tables? Yes. Are there people? Yes. Are there cats? Yes. Right. And so on. Um, where there's a revisionary answer, we can see this as implicitly engaging in a kind of metalinguistic negotiation. So it may be common sense that there's freedom in some sense, but the um, incompatibilist who says there's no such thing as freedom in the world can be seen as implicitly pressing for dropping the use of this term because it seems to be in conflict with what we know empirically and because it seems to lead to practices they would have us revise practices involving retributive punishment, and so on. So it gives us the common sense answers, so this is questions considered internally, we can still make sense of what the revisionist is up to. It also avoids rivalry with science, right? because the project of explicating our conceptual scheme and figuring out whether, when, and how to revise it are really different projects than the project of using that scheme in answering empirical Questions. Again, I'm not saying that science doesn't engage in this. Right? Biologists have engaged in a huge amount of conceptual negotiation over species terms. How should we use the term species? And friends in philosophy of biology tell me there's something like 20 something different species concepts, right? So scientists do this too, but when they do, they're at the corners that are most philosophical. And they most often interact with philosophers working in philosophy of biology, for example. And they're different projects regardless of the title of the person who's engaging in them. Okay. Another nice feature, so we don't have rivalry with science, we have different kinds of projects identified, is it was embarrassing for mainstream metaphysics that we had this view that we're discovering worldly truths, but there was this huge diversity of answers given, there is no agreement on them. Well, once you take it in a new spirit, this isn't such an embarrassment, right? The diversity of views about, say, what a person is or what the criteria of personal identity are can be seen as articulations of different concepts of person that might even be useful in different purposes, in different contexts, right, different purposes. Maybe there's a medical concept of person, there's also maybe a legalistic concept of person. Maybe one that's better tied to our moral concept. Do we need to unite them to just one or not? These are all questions in conceptual engineering. But in conceptual engineering, as with other forms of engineering, right, there may be no uniquely best solution, even though some solutions are better than others. There's not a uniquely best bridge to build over the river, though some designs may be far better than others, given the constraints of how much weight it's to carry, how much money you have to spend how long it should last, etc. Right? So we can see these then as alternative solutions to engineering problems, not as, oh, competing accounts of the truth. And that's kind of nice. Then it also tells us that far from what Brian Francis said, he said, oh, look, we can't know the answers. Give up. Do something useful. Right? Here, we have other reason not to fall into a kind of skeptical torpor that says give up. Because what concepts we use of person, of freedom, of race, of art, matter to how we live our lives and to what we do. Right? So we have reason to work on this seriously. And this is something, at least, we can hope metaphysicians can contribute to. Finally, we get epistemological clarity. Right? Unlike the mysteries of serious metaphysics, we can say that addressing these questions requires nothing more mysterious than empirical work and conceptual work, now making explicit that this conceptual work can be descriptive or normative. And on this view, right, we retain the sense that metaphysics has worldly relevance and importance. It remains deep, interesting, and difficult, not a sort of parochial, as I to put it, matter of 
seeing what our concepts happen to be. Right? Because what concepts we keep and which ones we reject and how we use them really matters. Again, think about concepts like death, freedom, or race concepts. Okay, so we can keep this view that metaphysics retains worldly relevance and importance without retaining the epistemological mystery. And so, then the thought is, by taking this sort of reconception of metaphysics that I've presented the outlines for to you today, we can better preserve the importance of metaphysics, not by treating it as a sort of quasi-science, quasi-discovering deep facts about what really exists, but rather by bringing up front its role in clarifying and choosing our concepts, for these are issues that have real importance to how we express our theories, to how we live, and to what we value. And that's it. like numbers don't exist. As expressing okay. as an off claim, we, sh we ought to stop using number theoretic framework and then we read this off in an expressivistic manner. So do you think this second part of this proposal is valid? Of reading the ought in an expressivistic yeah. manner. So let me think about this for a minute, try to remember how this fits. Um, Okay, so I have more, and I'm not, it's not coming to mind, but I have this paper where I give a more direct response, like there's no exit problem and stuff too. Um, first, I think his view is very close to mine. Um, I wouldn't say directly that an existence claim like numbers don't exist should be given the meaning of an ought claim, if that is its meaning, as a semantic content that we ought to stop using number terms. That's where I think this machinery of metalinguistic negotiation helps, because we can see the literal content as numbers don't exist, but what's being pragmatically done there is pressing for this acceptance of something like this ought claim. But to get to your main question, should this ought be read expressivistically? Um, I think there's... Let's think it is an expression of, of an attitude of ours. So let me just say a few things in response and tell me if this has got enough memory of crowd in it. Um, so I do think that once we sort of identify the ought claim that's being pragmatically advocated for in making these ontological claims, um, we can often assess these pragmatically, that is to say, it will better fulfill the functions of talk of death, right, to shift to this, where we can have also empirical modes of evaluating whether that's a successful engineering move, essentially. Where they are not just pragmatic, but also more moral, ethical, there I am very inclined to take something like an expressivist route, or at any rate, a non-descriptivist mm -hmm. route. And in order to avoid the epistemological mysteries, um, I certainly can't think of what we're doing when we have these more purely moral ops behind why we ought to drop talk of freedom or race or whatever, as a matter of discovering the moral facts, 
or else I end up with the same epistemological mysteries as my realist metaphysician opponents. So I'm very much inclined towards taking something in the expressivist camp view of these kinds of more moral thoughts. It doesn't have to be straight Blackburn. There's ways of going non-descriptivist that don't take them as expressions of our mental states, but rather as ways of conveying norms of behavior or something like that. But that's roughly the route I would take, yeah, for that reason. Yeah, I'm happy to take that on. Um, I just might have an answer for a second here. So, yeah, I really think that this approach isn't so far from the historical Quine. Where it's farther from is the neo-Quinean metaphysicians that I encounter all the time in my philosophical life from people like Cider and Van and Wagen and so on. And I think there's reasons for thinking, and I think Hugh Price has a very nice paper showing why they're kind of wrong about the historical crime. There's still at least, there's two differences at least from the view I'm, I'm presenting and Quine's words anyway. So there's a nice paper, by the way, by um, a grad student. Um, his name is escaping me now, Sam. Anyway, who analyzes, takes some of my work and analyzes the debate between Carnap and Quine as itself a metalinguistic negotiation for how we should use the word ontology. Carnap basically thinks, given its old associations, we should dump it. And Quine says, hey, if it's a meaningless word, it's with meaningless words I feel most free to assign a new meaning to, right? So Quine, of course, says something like, we've done our ontology when we fixed upon the conceptual scheme to be used for science in the broadest sense. That's very close to me, as I think you're suggesting. There's still two differences to point out. One is, I don't think we're done what we've done with science. That is, I don't think the work of metaphysics and philosophy should just be fixing the right conceptual scheme for the sciences. And the other is this use of the paraphrase method to reduce our ontological commitment that I think has led metaphysicians so far astray since Quine, which I think is just a matter of hiding problems under the rug that doesn't really tell us anything about what exists. Um, but with those reservations in place, yeah, that aspect of Quine I think is very close to me, and I totally agree that there's room for this kind of understanding of what we can and should be up to philosophically, as also engaged, often hand in hand with the sciences, because biologists know what we need a concept of species for. They know the function of the term and how it's been used much more intimately than non-biologists. What we can do as philosophers of biology is to work with them on this kind of normative conceptual work. Similarly, to work with the cognitive scientists, neurologists, and so on, on how we should talk about consciousness and intentional action and things. Yeah, yeah, love it. The only reason I speak more limitedly in metaphysics here is because that's what I know best. What I would hope is that it can eventually be broadened out to cover a lot more of philosophy. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for the helpful suggestion. Thank you very much. More questions, please. Uh, so thanks for uh, that very nice prophetic talk. Uh, I started to wonder when you were uh, raising those empirical doubts concerning metaphysical properties, how does it fit with like, the defense of armchair philosophy as done by 
Det er Stambay. Det er Williamson, ja. That's an interesting question, you know, I have to think about it. Um, so Williamson and I have mostly been at odds. Um, largely because he so vehemently denies the existence of any conceptual content, conceptual truths, that would underwrite my easy inferences. So I've been at odds with him on that, but that's the internal side. And your question is, can we agree on the external side? And that's a very interesting question. I want to sort of go back to his work with that in mind. I mean, certainly, what he says about, that I remember, again, this is calling back to mind quickly, a lot of complex work, um, armchair philosophy, a lot of it he thinks of as involving these sort of offline thought experiments that involve imagining counterfactuals, yeah? It's happened before. Um, and I, so I don't disagree with that, but I think of it as more limited. That is, I think a lot of what we do in philosophy isn't analogous to imagining what would happen if this rock were to roll down the hill. Would it stop by the bush or go into the lake? Right, this kind of um, empirical counterfactual, but also these kinds, kind of reasoning that just involves making use of our conceptual scheme, like would a person who was um, had a gun to their head and did something immoral, we count them as free, for example. Or imagine a, um, a work of art, so, well, imagine a work that the artist just gives minimal instructions for and it's painted by a hundred different people in a hundred different cities in a hundred different ways, is that a work of art, right? So Williamson, because of his hostility to conceptual content, doesn't say much about those kinds of cases. He occasionally mentions like, oh, what a, if there was a gathering of 12 people, would that be a large party, right? Which seems to be conceptual work. But he doesn't go into much detail over it. And for me, that kind of conceptual work figuring out how we do it and also how we ought to do it is going to play the predominant role. So I would sort of highlight different aspects than he would, but maybe there's other aspects of his, of what he says about this kind of armchair philosophy that make it more amenable to conceptual negotiation. Are there parts I'm forgetting that I'm leaving out here? It would be nice if I didn't have to fight him so much, so I like, I like the thought. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's, um, uh, if, uh, if it's a philosophical question, but let's, let's give it a go. So, uh, say that uh, we all agree, uh, we would all agree that um, what's left for metaphysics is uh, uh, the conceptual work to do, and uh, also say that uh, we all agree that the concept of freedom is, uh, is un unnecessary. Mm -hmm. So, how do we apply it to, to language? I mean. Uh, we would, wouldn't go out of the uh, you know, building and start saying, people, you know, you, you shouldn't use the word freedom because it's <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure it's a philosophical question, but... It's a real question. No, absolutely. This is something I kind of worry about, right? Because obviously at the end of the day, if you think you're on the right track to this kind of conceptual renegotiation, you have to hope for uptake, right? I worry about this with Sally Hasslinger's work, right? She has this really nice view about how we should redo our race concepts. How do we get that into the world? Who, those who seem to have the most power in this regard are the lawyers, more than the philosophers, right? I mean, the lawyers are often involved very straightforwardly, and judges, right, in reinterpreting what counts as a person? Well, my, the lawyers in my wonderful country have decided that a corporation is a person, right? Great. <laughs> they should leave it to them. Um, in determining what counts as a child, who counts as responsible. There's, I think, some hope for a kind of trickle-down influence. I mean, certainly philosophical works 
on freedom, on nationhood, on rights and human rights, have been known to have impact on how nations and courts define their terms and use them, which eventually trickles down, usually, to how the rest of us use them. In the US, I don't know how it is here, the vast majority of our good undergraduate students go on to be lawyers, <laughs> go on to law school. So we can hope that the work that we teach them and the style of engagement we teach them can have effect and uptake by that kind of route. Um, we can also hope that to the extent that we have philosophers who are engaged in working with philosophers of biology who are working with biologists, uh, cognitive philosophers who are working of mind who are working with cognitive scientists, philosophers of physics who are working with physicists, to the uh, psychology, heaven knows they need our help. Right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, they're involved, in, <laughs> they're involved in conceptual renegotiation every time they rewrite that DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, right? So we can hope by, I think what it would really, the, the most direct method would be by trying to work with those who do have the authority, whether legally or in the specific disciplines, to try to find concepts that will work and persuade them that this kind of move is worthwhile. I suppose there's also some hope for a general popular uptake from the bottom up. That's, I don't know how to do that exactly. Philosophers don't tend to get a million hits on YouTube or you know, things that are going to reach the popular consciousness that quickly. But at least by working with the sources of authority, there may be some. I think um, Herman Kaplan's um, conceptual engineering lab in Oslo, they are working on, what is it? They have a branch working on human, uh, what counts as a non combatant for military purposes? So that's a concept you have to redraw, and they're actually working with government agencies on this. So there's some hope of precedent. But I agree, I think that's a really serious issue if you want to actually have the kind of useful uptake that I'm hoping for in my optimistic conclusion. So I have a question. Uh, do you think that according to your uh, theory, there are some uh, harder questions of ontology possible? For example, let's assume that your inference about this example of properties uh, mm -hmm. is correct and mm -hmm. properties exist. So it is possible to, uh, to, to, to ask a question like how they exist in, in this way that uh, they are real entities or nominal entities. I mean that in, in, your, in your theory it is possible to recall a, a distinction between realists and nominalists about properties, for example. Yeah, so that's... Because some harder questions might look like or maybe they are not possible at all. I think they're possible. I don't think they're hard in my technical sense of requiring more than empirical and conceptual work, but that conceptual work can be descriptive or pragmatic. I haven't talked about them today. Yeah, so there's all these other metaphysical questions of the natures of things of various sorts, which includes questions about their identity and persistence conditions, questions about their nature that would arise in debates about Platonism over properties and so on. So those questions, I have a book on modality I'm working on now that addresses that side of metaphysics. Roughly I see them as, again, they're answerable in two ways. Internally, I think the way to answer them is, as Ingarden would have done, or Husserl would have done, right? By a kind of conceptual analytic work. So we can look to how our property talk actually functions and say that given that, assuming that it's true, that you can make the inference from the chair is blue to there is a property of blueness the chair has, or from the chair isn't blue to there is a property of blueness the chair lacks, right? That this preserves the sense that the, we can get the conclusion that the property exists regardless of any empirical facts about the world. Right? This is Plate's laser, Husserlian method, I have a recent paper on Husserl on this. Um, and in that sense, that captures the Platonist's insight. Right? That properties are independent of anything empirical. Right? But we also might want to um, convict certain ways that the Platonist speaks. That they think that what we're doing is sort of discovering things in a Platonic heaven, rather than making inferences. We could say they're going wrong in those ways. Similarly, if you want to know things about the nature of persons with identity and persistence conditions, I think of these done in the internal mode as ways of expressing in the object language 
what the rules are for using the terms in question. So that's how I think of metaphysical modal claims. Um, so again, the internal sort of answer, I think you can get by conceptual analysis, such as there is answer. Right? There would be some unanswerable questions, too, that are poorly formed. There's also the external, external questions about how we ought to use the relevant terms. And sometimes I think um, revisionary answers about the natures of things of various sorts. Like um, David Davies has this view that works of art, like paintings, aren't objects that you can hang on the wall. Instead, they are actions, the performances of an artist in a particular place and time. Right? Um, but this is, for him, pretty explicitly a proposal that we ought to use the term art in this way because it coheres better with our critical and appreciative practices than the view that works of art are objects. So, yes, yeah, so I think those questions remain. I didn't talk about them today. I do think that such as are well formed can be addressed by these either empirical or more often conceptual, descriptive, and um, normative methods. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me.